Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Today's special guest is Paul Constant. He's the writer and creator of Snelson Comedy is Dying from Ahoy Comics. Like, come join me as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Constant. So, thank you so much for coming to the Traverse of the Stars podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, it's definitely my pleasure. So, I always like to start off with a question of inspiration. So, what inspired you to become a writer, and who are your earliest influences? Boy, I I think I I as soon as I understood there was something called writing, I wanted to be a writer. Um, I was I was a ridiculously early le- reader, um, and so I uh, sort of taught myself how to read using you know hooked on phonics and um, and then uh, my older brother's comic books, uh, his uh, uh, especially. Um, Superman comics of the 1970s, those were huge with me. Um, uh, the Byrne Claremont X-Men were a little scary, um, but I was really <laughs> into them. You know, they, they really freaked me out, but uh, Wolverine I was terrified of. But uh, uh, so yeah, those were, those were the first things that I, I, I learned how to read. I fell in love with reading. And then once I learned that there were writers, uh, I was pretty much, um, uh, I, was, I was all in um, with being a writer. So it's pretty much been my whole life. Well, well, looking at your background, you definitely like books. That, that is a lot of books, right? That that's like a bibliophile uh, heaven, right there. Yeah, this is my <laughs> this is my uh, my library. I guess it is now. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's pretty it's pretty wonderful. It's uh, the nicest thing about having my own bookshelves is that I can do strict alphabetical order for authors, so I know where everything is. Oh, and, very oh God, nice! Such a, such a nerdy thrill, you know. Except, of course, like. Superman, for instance, is under SU. So, uh, uh, you know, because there are so many authors of Superman that I had to, I had mm. to sort of uh, fake it, and 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 you know, so like superheroes are under their 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 names, and then uh, author names are are uh, are all la- last name alphabetical, strict alphabetization. So, so we went full Dewey Decimal, did we? Or <laughs> not quite, not quite. No, I'm a bookseller. Uh, by I I I my I worked as a bookseller for like you know 15 years uh before i started writing full-time so mm. i'm not not quite librarian nerdy enough i don't have the dewey decimal system memorized so. now from from one biblical file probably to another now are all these books ones that you've read or you like me where you have tons of shelves of books that you haven't read but you damn well bought each one of them just in case <laughs> eventually you get to them it's a good mix it's a good mix uh a lot of these i have read over the course of my life um, I have actually one shelf here, one of those vertical shelves that is just like incoming books. So books that I, I'm looking forward to reading soon. Mm. Uh, and then behind me over there, I have, uh, this, is, this is way too wonky, but uh, uh, those are my books on the way out that I'm going to <laughs> sell to a bookstore for credit and buy more books for the in pile. So oh, wow. it's, it's, a, it's a good mix. I mean, you know, uh, there are quite a few books here that I've read over and over again and uh, some, you know, comics that I'll never let go of. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, is, that is the one pleasure of um, buying books and comics. It's, it's really, it's the collecting. I mean, it's the boxes and just watching your collection just get larger and larger and more unwieldy until you're just like, I don't know why I still have all these, but damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've gotten pretty good at trimming things. Like I can tell when I'm not going to reinvestigate something, you know, uh, but uh, but I, I do have a sentimental attachment to quite a few of them. So, mm. so not only are you a comic book writer, which we'll go into in just a moment, but you're also a journalist. So mm-hmm. which love came first, comic books, writing or journalism? Uh, comic books for sure, 100% first. Uh, I've been a comic fan for as, literally as long as I could read, a little longer. And um, uh, and then uh, journalism, I sort of got into uh, in the back door. Uh, so like I said, I, I um, became a bookseller. Um, first, I worked at a Borders in Boston, and then I got a job. I moved to Seattle and got a job at an independent bookstore in Seattle called LFA Book Company, which is a really great old independent bookstore. Um, and this was in 2000 and I had the great idea of starting a comic book section. They hadn't ever sold comics there before. They had, um, they called it sci-fi art. So they had like a, a battered copy of Watchmen next to like a Frank Frazetta collection. You know, it was like, it was just like, it was, it was chaos. Um, and uh, that just happened to be 
2000 just happened to be when comics were really breaking through, you know, Chris Ware's uh, Jimmy Corrigan really took off and things like that. So I looked really smart. Um, it was just coincidence. But uh, uh, and then uh, through my job at Elliott Bay, I got a job writing about books at a local alternative weekly called The Stranger. And then I started writing journalism for them. And I, I really do um, love writing journalism as well. But I'm I'm kind of a late bloomer in, in journalism and in writing comics. So. <laughs> So, so as a journalist and a writer, how does one skill or genre inform the other? Um, you know, I think that I write better dialogue now because I actually pay attention to what people say. Um, I do a lot of interviews. I do a lot of transcription. Um, and, and so paying attention to how people talk and the way that people uh, parse out information really influences um, the way that the way that I I write uh, people talking in my comics, um, and uh, as for the other way around, I don't know. I think that comics gave me a really sharp sense of uh, you know morality that sort of drove uh, a lot of the stuff that I was writing about as mm. as as a journalist. You know, like uh, uh, standing up for the little guy, all that Clark Kent stuff, Lois Lane. Um, uh, so really, I think that that instructed sort of uh, my sense of right and wrong. And I think that um, any good journalist is has has that sense and and isn't willing to let it go for, you know, a better paying job or something like that. So it is amazing how a fictional character like Superman can really inform our mor morality like that. I mean, we, I mean, growing up, you really are formed by Superman, who, again, not a real person in any way, shape or form, but in our minds really kind of became real. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Superman, uh, for me, it, it was a mix between Superman and Charlie Brown. I think Charlie Brown was more realistic. You know, I was always having the football pulled out from under me. Uh, uh, but uh, um, but Superman was always aspirational, you know, and I, I think um, uh, and and I think that's it's it's uh, it's interesting because you have generations of writers come and go. Right. And they're all writing about morality for what in one way or another. Um, but the idea of morality changes over time. So it's it's a it's a really interesting thing to sort of dig back into the history of the character um, and to, uh, you know, like in the 1950s, he was interested in preserving the status quo and, you know, America and, and uh, right or wrong. And but in the uh, when he first came about, he was, you know, beating up uh bad landlords mm. and um uh, and you know and fighting against the death penalty and all that so it's it's just it's it's um it, it is it's it's really interesting i think when you write about superman you're not just writing about a character you're writing about your idea of what's right and wrong and i think that's that's why he's always an interesting character you know it's kind of funny we're discussing superman because i literally just started reading a book called um is superman circumcised that go into the <laughs> jewishness of superman and the history mm. of the character and how like morality and religion all that uh, kind of combined with into the character and like i said it's, it is absolutely fascinating just the it, it 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 seems like over time comic books for many decades never got the respect they deserve but when mm -hmm. you look back you realize they really do have a lot of weight in as you mm -hmm. said forming the the morality of young people young minds as it were mm -hmm. for sure and 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 cultural identity and all mm -hmm. that you know i mean there's a lot of um, uh, you know, I mean, I just, I remember, I think it might've been a Grant Morrison interview or something like that, where, where, uh, you know, they talked about how, um, you know, L is, 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 you know, Hebrew for, for God. And it's just like all these things that sort of like crack open when you dig a little deeper into, into mm -hmm. where it comes from. And like, you know, of course they were writing about, uh, an immigrant who's come to America to make a, make it a better place. And, and so, um, yeah, there's just, there's, I think even kids can tell there's always something a little deeper at play there yeah. uh, and sort of tapping into that. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting, once again, and I wonder if this has to do a little bit with your journalism background. Um, some of your, a lot of your, or at least what I've read, does have a, a little bit of a political bent. Is mm -hmm. that informed because of the journalism or is that just because of what your concerns are? That's where you head into the journalism comes from. I think it's my I think it's my interest as a as a person in the world. I mean, my my Twitter bio says uh, I'm a political writer. Everything is political, and I, I I believe that's that to be true. I think that um, uh, uh, for me, you know, politics is how we 
uh, exist in the world with other people. Um, and, and I think the comics are, are really about that too. And they're a good place to sort of investigate those, those questions and, uh, and those sort of experiment with the idea of, of, um, of how, how, yeah, how we live together as, as a, as a, as a people. Well, I mean, I agree with you completely. I mean, I always argue to anyone who cares that comic books are inherently political, as is all art. I mean, there isn't, mm -hmm. if art is not political, then you're literally saying nothing. It, it has to be mm -hmm. on some level political, um, despite what a certain groups try to argue against that comic. You know, I'm not going to say which group it is because I don't want to give them any advertising. But comic <laughs> books are inherently political. They've been political. Once again, as you said, since Superman was fighting landlords who were, or mm -hmm. slumlords, they were been, they've been political since the very birth of the uh, genre. And like I said, because art, it, I would say, is inherently political. Yeah, I think if your art is apolitical, that's a political choice, right? If you if you think you can get away without uh, bringing a political perspective to your work, that's probably because you are the you know dominant political perspective, or because you're not interrogating your own political perspective. At all. Mm. So it's it, it's it's all a political choice. It's just a matter of how you approach it. And I mean, you know, I. Um, uh, and I, I respect that not everything, you know, not everyone needs to, uh, you know, I would not expect the characters of Saga to like look at the reader and say, remember to vote for Joe Biden, and, you know, like <laughs> nothing that overt. Like, I think that it's very easy to be sort of corny or whatever in, in, in your political writing. But I think that uh, everything you write as a writer has a political valence of some sort. Um, it's just a question of whether you're aware of it or not. I, I would agree completely. Like Saga, like you said, it may not be um, a, a, um, overt, you know, um, you know, we're doing, um, you know, Biden, but it's allegorical on some level, no matter what they do. Oh yeah. Saga's a, it's a, it's a feminist story, right? Like it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a book that investigates what it is to be a family, uh, you know, through what I think is a, uh, 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 you know, uh, investigating um uh what it means to be a woman in society even though it's got spaceships and all these wonderful things in it it's it's still i don't think uh either brian von or or fiona staples would say it's not a political book in in one way or another mm. now that brings me to the the graphic novel that you um um have written or is released or you're releasing soon called snelson comedy is dying mm -hmm. now there's been a lot of conversation about comedy in the world of either however you want to uh, phrase it, either political correctness on one end or wokeness if you're on the other side of um, going mm -hmm. against it. But there's a, there's a question of what role does comedy have in this ever-changing, maybe more socially aware um, society? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, and part of that even came up even more recently, um, and I'm, I will reference it, the uh, Will Smith, Chris Rock incident, it kind of also bring up the idea of what should you say and cannot say in, you know, in public. So mm -hmm. what was the inspiration behind writing Snelson Comedy is Dying? And was the title purposely um, provocative? Yeah, the title was purposefully provocative. Um, so, so Snelson Comedy is Dying is about a uh, comedian from the 1990s who almost hit it big. He, had a, uh, uh, he filmed a pilot episode for a sitcom that never went anywhere. And his career has just slowly been circling the drain ever since. Uh, and he's seen himself sort of fall out of relevance. Um, and so he decides at some point that he's going to do whatever he can to um, regain some of that relevance that he enjoyed. Uh, and of course, as he's a straight white man, um, uh, who is kind of lazy, the easiest way for him to do that is to bring some politics into his work. And that means sort of playing into this idea of comedy being under assault by the, you know, cancel culture crew or whatever. Um, so yeah, the, the title is supposed to, uh, supposed to evoke that kind of a thing. It's also, um, uh, there, I, I live in Seattle, as I said, and, and, uh, there's a uh, right-wing uh, station out here uh, that's owned by Sinclair Media, which is which owns a bunch of uh, uh, TV stations in different markets, and they have a, a very conservative spin. They put out a special called Seattle is Dying, and um, uh, and it was all about how, you know, there are homeless people, and, and uh, it's out of control, and all these, you know, homeowners uh, are, are worried about what the value of their home is going to be, and, and um, and it just struck me as such a ludicrous statement because uh, that gave their reporters the ability to go to any politician and say, is Seattle dying? Which is really a kind of a, 
you know, Senator, are you still beating your wife kind of a question? Right, 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 you, right. You're immediately on the back foot, right? When, when somebody says Seattle is dying or comedy is dying, you're like, no, mm. it's better than ever. And, <laughs> and you, you, you're, you're coming from a place of weakness. So the framing was so, um, uh, was so ridiculous that I, I, I kind of, I, I did want to embrace it to sort of give people an idea of, um, of what was going on in the book. So is Nelson based on any Pacific comedian that you know of, or is he just, is he sort of like a, an amalgamation of multiple comedians or is he just something that popped out of your brain? He's, uh, he's an amalgamation of a bunch of comedians and a bunch of people my age. I'm 45. Um, and I've been watching, uh, you know, people who I, uh, went to high school with, uh, slowly start to, um, develop a real nostalgia for the 90s it's the time they grew up when they're like kids these days you know can't be left home alone and all that but we in our day were and and um um uh, so there's just this sort of creeping cultural nostalgia for the 90s that i think is is as somebody who lived through it is totally unwarranted and very <laughs> weird so it's not just comedians it's sort of what i see happening in in in, in my peer group um, but for sure, I mean, I have, you know, listened to some episodes of uh, Joe Rogan where comedians complain about not being able to say what they want to say anymore mm. and all that and, and sort of incorporated them. It's The book is really sort of a sponge for all of my ideas about what's happening in, in society right now and, and sort, of, uh, uh, sort of poking at the ideas in different ways, I think. So the, the idea, because I've heard a lot of comedians, some comedians say, and I think I, I was not too long ago, I listened to Bill Maher. He's like, you can't go to colleges anymore. Co co you know, comedians can't go to colleges anymore. Is, is the problem that they can't do certain jokes or is it that certain jokes are just easier to do? Or is it that they're not good enough to tell jokes in a different way as society has shifted? Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a mix of all of that, right? Like, I think that Bill Maher is not funny anymore and he's taking it out on his audience. Um, you know, I think that, 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 uh, uh, a lot of comedians just don't want to change, uh, or don't see any reason to change. Uh, and they've been doing it. And I, I would say the title character in, in Snelson is, is definitely that kind of a person. Um, uh, I think also that, uh, and this goes back to my time as a journalist, I think that social media has made it easy for people to respond. Um, you know, it used to be, if you wanted to complain about a comedian uh, at a college, you would have to like write a letter to the school <laughs> newspaper and just mail it in. Mm -hmm. There's a huge lift there, but you can get on Twitter and say, you know, uh, uh, Bill Maher uh, made a racist joke last night and, and it'll, it'll get lift and it'll take off and it, it does lose some context and, it, you know, and it becomes this conversation that's sort of out of control and it's fed by headlines and all that. So it's very easy. It's, it's easy for people to talk back. Um, which a lot of entertainers haven't had to deal with before, um, it, you know, except for like a heckler one-on-one -on -one situation. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people sort of lost their minds when that happened. Um, you know, when I was in journalism, it was sort of the height of comment culture. And we were all told to just ignore the comments, but everybody obsessed over the comments, right? It was all these people who hated everything we wrote. And yeah. like, how could you not obsess over it? So I, I think we're in a huge sort of cultural shift where like, we're realizing that 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 our audiences are people with opinions too <laughs> and that's that uh, i think a lot of people it, it honestly broke their brain i think if you look at like um, uh uh you know bill maher or even like jerry seinfeld or you know some of the some of the the, the people who came up in the 90s i think they're they're having a real hard time adjusting to it now without dropping the hammer on journalism too much because as you said you're a journalist i don't want to uh, hit you on the head too much is is there a part of the problem is that some of these there's just you know there's people who have valid complaints and there's people who are even on the um the right or the left who are overly sensitive to certain things that are done or said and because their sensitivities on the on the extreme are being uh perpetuated and you know and me and, and those stories are being told that there's this overwhelming thought that everyone has become too sensitive or is it just those who are extreme, extremely sensitive are just beginning way or being allowed to be more vocal because they're getting coverage. 
I think it's I think it's all of that. I don't think that people are necessarily any more sensitive than they were, but they have more avenues to speak out. And and you know, and I think that that's one of the things that gets underplayed is that uh, social media has taught me a lot about what it's like to be from another perspective. You know, who's not a straight white male. You know, like, um, uh, you know, like. I, it, it, it was not that uncommon a few years ago to have white people say like, why did all these cops start killing all these black people, you know? Mm. And it's like, no, th there just weren't cameras available right. to everybody at all times, you know? So like, so, so we are getting a sense of what it's like to, 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 to walk in, in, in these people's shoes and, um, and we're getting a sense of their day-to-day -day experience in a really real and visceral way. And so, you know, of course, there's going to be discomfort on all sides, as opposed mm. to just on uh, on 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 you know on their side, on you know the side of somebody who's trans or who's uh, asexual or who, mm. who you know who in years past just had to sort of keep it to themselves and wonder if they were alone. Um, so it's 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 I think it's a growing pains issue is what we're living with right now, and hopefully we'll you know figure out some solutions. <laughs> I, agree you, I, I agree with you 100. I mean. I must admit, I, I think um, 15, 20 years ago, I don't know um, if my perspective as, you know, as a young guy, you know, young white guy, if I understood, you know, what was going on with um, black people and police, I think mm. I would have been like, well, yeah, it happens once in a while, but I, I think my, I was probably was in the um, stereotypical, well, then don't do anything wrong. And you keep watching the videos, you're like, oh, fuck, you know, yeah. that is, <laughs> this is a real fucking thing, you know what I mean? And it took yeah. videos and videos to be like, listen, you, you know, you um you you whites you single you know what you know you white guy whatever that in the in the suburbs you don't get what's happening and then you go oh okay no this is real this is definitely something and i think without the cameras it would have been harder to buy into it yeah but i think yeah. it helps to go to look at it and go oh shit you know this mm -hmm. is a real thing um these are 100 valid problems that are happening and i'm seeing things wrong from my own you know sheltered perspective Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think that, you know, I think that if you're not making those realizations, then you're sort of digging yourself a hole, right? By, <laughs> by, you're, you're, you're barricading yourself from from experiences. So, you know, I'm definitely, you know, I have definitely, uh, my feelings on things have evolved as I've learned about things. And it's been, it's been, you know, sometimes it's an embarrassing thing to realize, oh, I'm, I've, I've been, you know, I've held this racist assumption for a long time or something mm. like that. But um, in the end, I generally, I think I almost always feel better having realized it um, than, than, uh, um, uh, than if I just, you know, stayed in my in my sheltered little place and 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 not bothered to think about how other people felt well i mean i, I think that's why I, I think ignorance is not something to be embarrassed by you know what i'm saying like we all start right. from a certain point of it it's not to be embarrassed by something to recognize but but embarrassed i think is when you start getting defensive and that's not mm -hmm. where we should be coming from and, and that's my personal opinion on that mm -hmm. anyway you know no, I agree. I, I totally agree. I totally agree with that. And I can understand that it, it's it's different when um, you know, you or I or somebody who's who's un you know relatively unfamous uh has a learning moment like this than when say like I don't know, like uh I'm trying to think of a comedian who who did not learn this gracefully. But you know, when you're a uh, Dave Chappelle says, <laughs> Dave Chappelle and and all of a sudden it feels like the whole world is telling you you're you're an idiot and you're an asshole. And so you're gonna like double down and be like, no, I'm not wrong. You're wrong. Like I've always been right. This is right. And so so I I agree that there the the scale is all off, right? Like mm. um so so what might be a learning experience for you or me where we like personally see something and 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 feel changed uh when the whole world is going you're an asshole i can understand that like i'm gonna i'm gonna you know buckle down and fight right. back because this does not feel right to me this does not feel like a uh uh uh, uh you know a um uh, a response to scale to fit you know whatever mistake i may have made well, so. a character in, in your in uh, Snelson made an interesting quote, and I, and I want to discuss that quote that because um, it's relevant to what we're discussing. It says um, the character of Jeff says, "We're all monsters in the comedy business." Mm -hmm. Now, is this a statement about those who enter the comedy business, or is, is is this a comment about what the business does to those who enter it? I think um, I think any sort of 
a performative career um and 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 i include writing in that and i think comic artists are probably the same way i think there is a certain amount of um uh i would say that you know i've written about things that have caused people to hate me um uh i've written about things that have gotten a really negative reaction from people and I have like mined my own personal life for for stories, and none of those things are necessarily um, considered good or appropriate things to do unless you're in this career, right? So, like, I think when you make art, um, you do run the risk of 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 being a little bit of a monster, and I think that's that's maybe part of the process of creation, and I think that's. Uh, uh, um, uh, and, and you know, and there are different ways to do it. And there are ways to be a responsible monster and to, you know, people who write memoirs, tell all memoirs, you know, there's a way to do it that's really unethical that like burns everybody in your past, burns bridges. And then you can also like, you know, take a more journalistic approach and and take your memoir to people and check quotes and uh, and try to include other people's perspectives and things like that. But there's a huge spectrum in there in between that, um, you know, so so comedians are, exploiting their past and they're they're uh winning those fights that they had with their exes that they may have lost in in real life and and you know so there's there's always a little bit of an aspect of of uh some injustice that can happen um to other people when you're when you're putting yourself out there like that so i mean is is the problem that was celebrities or anyone who's out there or trying to get i mean let's face it every artist every writer is has an obsessive need with being liked. We want everyone to love our stuff. You know, we 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 need we need positive reinforcement constantly. Uh -huh. That that's that's why we do what we do. You know, um, but is that the problem with that's going on with comedians or in this area? Is that is an obsession with being relevant? That you have to be relevant because that's where the money, that's where the popularity is. And if you stop being relevant, you stop getting that love, and then is the that you know that emptiness, the void comes. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think you know, I think that that. Um you know, you don't get to be a, a multi-million dollar professional without deeply caring what other people think of you, right? Mm. Like, you don't get to become uh, a, a, a stand-up comedian who spills your guts on stage every night for, you know, 350 days a year or whatever, because you don't care what people think. So, um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's easier to get a rise out of people. Um, uh, you know, like there are other ways to be a comedian than to always be on the edge of relevance um, or to uh, to 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 have your finger on the pulse of what the kids are talking about or something like that. But that's also a lot more work than it is to just like offend the right person and then turn that into press. Um, so, yeah, it's a it's a dance. It's a dance. So the the, the, the graphic novel, um, uh, Snelson, it implies that the right, the alt-right is just easier to Im get embraced by, that they are more likely to stand in line behind you than the left. Is that an observation that's accurate or not? Um, it's certainly easier for Snelson to appeal to the alt-right. I, I think that it's easier to be, if you don't have moral scruples about it, I think, you know, I think it would be easy to, uh lay down a little bit of an alt, alt right grift for sure um uh so maybe it's a little easier although i you know there are certainly um uh, grifters on the left too you know i mean we've we've all seen people on twitter who are like running fundraisers and you know that like um ukrainian people aren't seeing any of that money um you know so like it's 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 not necessarily it's not that like one side is good um is 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 uh is is good and is never tricked and the other side is uh um well the other side is kind of evil and <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we're if we're talking about the alt-right then yeah that's pretty much always evil so uh yeah maybe it is maybe it is a little easier maybe so so with the character of snelson is he oblivious to the damage he's doing once he moves towards the right or does he not care because it's perpetuating what he needs to have happen and for him, does whoever ends his ends, which is obviously fame, fortune, whatever, justify everything that he's doing to help create more 
whatever phrases alt right bastards or whatever yeah chaos <laughs> yeah uh, it's it's i think that um uh i think that it's very easy to make yourself the hero of your own story and i think that's what he does right he he shuts down there are several seats uh, uh scenes throughout the book where he's confronted with what he's done and he tries to justify it by saying look no uh, I don't have any control over those those trolls who are harassing you online, right? Like I said something on a, you were on my podcast. I said something, they responded. I don't have any control over that. Um, so he's very good at justifying himself and justifying his actions and saying, I only did this because I'm responding to this um, uh, uh, and, and to believe that you haven't changed at all. But I think over the course of the book, he does change in his tolerance for, that kind of alt-right, um, you know, Nazi stuff, uh, his tolerance gets higher and higher. Um, and, and so I think that the, the, and I think that's kind of what the book is about a little bit is about, um, you know, it's like uh, Kurt Vonnegut in Mother Night where uh, the, the, the main character is, is an American who becomes a Nazi, but he, he could be a spy. And the thing that he keeps saying to him, uh, the thing that he learns is that you are what you pretend to be. Mm. And I think that's I think that's definitely a theme of of the book is is uh, I think he thinks he's just pretending to be that way to get butts in the seats at his shows. Um, but I think that he 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 learns a little bit along the way that he has he has become what he's pretending he, he is. So so um, when can our listeners buy Snelson Comedy is Dying? Anywhere, anywhere you buy books. Uh, it's in comic book stores. It's also distributed to bookstores uh, through Simon & Schuster. Um, uh, I know LEFA Book Company, the bookstore that I worked at in Seattle has copies. Um, uh, if you ask nicely in an email, I can even sign it for you uh, 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 at LEFA. And um, yeah, it's it's available anyway. I, I, it's on Comixology. It's 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 pretty much anywhere, uh, and you can also request it from your local library because I am a huge fan of libraries. And um, uh, and so yeah, it's 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 anywhere anywhere books are sold. Well, Mr. Constant, thank you so much for talking with me. I I really think Nelson Comedy is Dying is a very intelligent book, okay. and I thank you so much for talking with me. Yeah, thanks so much. It's been it's been a lot of fun to, to talk with you. Thanks, you too. Thank you.